Mr. Dimopoulos, who knows, Ella Giorgo. So may I have the panelists join us? This is a, a big panel, but also it's the longest panel, it's about an hour. So you will all have the time to make your points. And this is a highly interesting panel. Good afternoon from my side. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to moderate uh, this panel, uh, taking some time to, for our panel members to uh, sit down. Um, I'm going to promise you a very interesting uh, discussion here. It's a very hot topic. I would like to sincerely thank uh, Mr. Bornozis for uh, inviting us and uh, having this discussion. So, uh, I will move uh, directly to our uh, business, to our order of uh, our panel. Uh, we are going to discuss the upcoming uh, 2020 Law Surfer Compliance Regulations by IMO. And uh, we are hoping to address this very hot topic right now um, in, in as much a holistic way as uh, possible. Uh, we understand that uh, compliance under the CAP 2020 has a lot of dimensions, technical dimensions involving uh, both compliant fuels and desulfurization scrubbers, ranging from fuel availability, uh, uh, compatibility, scrubber uh, uh, technology selection, installation, operability issues, but also has important uh, financial aspects, project financing under, uh, uh, for these big uh, retrofitting and building projects, uh, uh, premiums uh, with respect to uh, uh, evolution of charter rates, but also legal uh, and insurance aspects when it comes to scrubbers. Uh, with our excellent panel here, I'm hoping that uh, we are able to address all this and I immediately uh, give the floor to our uh, panel members and I would uh, like to kindly ask them to uh, very briefly uh, present uh, themselves. So, starting from uh, Lee, our resident IMO, all panel member here. Uh, yes, good afternoon. You probably remember me from this morning. I'm the one who doesn't have any technical knowledge. Um, <laughs> and I still don't. Um, but uh, I, I'm not sure. Am I, am I supposed to speak now or just introduce myself? Just introduce yourself. Okay, that's it. Done. Thanks. <laughs> My name is Mikhail Shapiro. I work for Glencore. I'm in charge of the implementation of this legislation uh, across the company. I'm also in charge of the marine fuels business. And for those of you that are not familiar with Glencore, uh, obviously we're a commodities trader. We're involved in uh, products from fuel oil, distillate, uh, LNG, crudes. Obviously we have a fairly large shipping fleet. And uh, some years ago we purchased a bumper supplier named Chemoil. Uh, now it operates as Glencore. We have a local Greek office uh, to help with the local Greek ship on our needs. And uh, that's basically what we do. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Keith Dorr, and I work with Cargill's ocean transportation team. Uh, we operate about 650 vessels, mostly dry bulk. Um, we charter them all in. We don't own any of them. Um, and I'm responsible for implementing the 2020 project. Good afternoon. My name is Dimitrios Vastarogas. I am the Deputy Chief Operating Officer and Technical Director of Danau Shipping. Uh, you know very well that Danau uh, is involved mainly with business in the container ship uh, sector. So I will try today to provide some insight from my owner's point of view in this specific industry. Good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. My name is Tamatis Borboulis. Uh, I'm uh, the general manager of Euronav Ship Management Elas, the office of Euronav in Greece, and we do the management of the uh, seagoing fleet of uh, Euronav. 
Uh, Euronav is uh, currently owns and controls uh, 75 uh, crude oil uh, carriers, VLCCs and Suez Max tankers. Uh, and thanks again for the invitation. Good afternoon. My name is Lucas Barbaris. I'm president of Safe Barkers. Safe Barkers is a New York listed company with 41 dry bulk vessels, mainly medium sized vessels. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Nikos Reskos. I'm the chief operating officer of Starbuck Carriers. We are the largest listed dry bulk operator in NASDAQ with uh, 111 vessels. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. Now uh, I would like to proceed with uh, our uh, question sessions. I would uh, very kindly ask all panel members to be uh, quite brief in their answers uh, since we are a large panel with a lot of interesting topics to be touched upon. And immediately, uh, my first question will go even to Lee, to IMO. And, uh, I, we would like to know more on uh, how IMO, how long IMO has been concerned with uh, reducing the uh, sulfur emissions, and what uh, in, is, in your opinion, the expected impact that 2020 will have to our uh, industry? Uh, yes, I'll be happy to uh, to address those. Um, it, it may seem to some as if this whole issue was one that has emerged in the last couple of years, but um, uh, in fact, the concern <coughs> with um, uh, international efforts to, uh, to address acidification and acid rain, which are two of the byproducts of, uh, of um, sulfur in emissions, goes back to uh, 1972. There was a UN Environment Conference in Stockholm, and in fact, in 1979, uh, was the first ever transboundary convention on air pollution and there have been a number of protocols since then um, beneficially phasing out things like um, CFCs and refrigerants, halon and so on. IMO first began discussing the issue um, in the 1980s uh, and in 1988 the Marine Environment Protection Committee first agreed to include air pollution on its agenda, and that was prompted by Norway. Uh, three years later, the IMO Assembly adopted a resolution asking the Marine Environment Protection Committee to develop a new MARPOL annex on air pollution. Um, that annex was developed and adopted six years later in 1977, sorry, 1997, sorry. Um, it set limits way back then on things like sulphur, um, nitrogen oxide and ozone depleting substances. Uh, it entered into force in 2005 um, and there was immediate agreement among the member states of IMO that it needed strengthening. Things had changed in the intervening years since it had been adopted. Uh, so a revised Annex 6 was adopted in 2008 and it was in 2008 that we saw the first mention of 1 January 2020 as uh, an implementation date for um, global cap of 0.5% sulphur uh, in ships fuel oil. Um, it was to be confirmed after uh, a feasibility study which had to be completed by 2018. Uh, in fact, that feasibility study was completed early in 2016 and uh, yes, the 2020 date was confirmed uh, in, in 2016. Um, and there was a view that that uh, certainly gave certainty to the refinery industry, to the bunkering industry and indeed to the, to the shipping industry. As I say, confirmation of the date that was first introduced in 2008. Um, what do we expect the impacts to be? Well, um, uh, very tangible health and environmental benefit, um, benefits are expected. Um, there's a figure which is often quoted from a Finnish study, um, but more than half a million premature deaths are likely to be avoided 
um, by introducing this uh, in 2020 rather than the later date which had been mooted by some of 2025. Um, health benefits are expected in terms of respiratory illness, lung disease, um, and the beneficial effect on acid rain uh, is expected to help alleviate things like damage to crops, to forests, to aquatic species, and to ocean acidification. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a unique opportunity having uh, four uh, leading shipping companies in our panel. And uh, I would like to ask uh, a short round uh, between the gentlemen from the shipping companies uh, to describe their uh, strategy and options uh, uh, with respect to CAP 2020 compliance. So, I move uh, first uh, to Mr. Uh, Rescos, and uh, uh, we would like to learn more about uh, what is uh, your uh, compliance uh, strategy and what is the business case behind it uh, based on uh, your experience. Technical issues, uh, operational market issues, and so on and so forth. We need a few more minutes to, to go through that, but I'll be as brief as possible. Starbuck was uh, an early mover in studying the uh, alternative ways to comply with the IMO regulation. Uh, we started back in 2016 once there was a decision to uh, implement the rule by January 1st, 2020. We uh, ended up uh, following the scrubber uh, initiative, and we believe that uh, this offers us ways comply with the IMO rules well and above uh, the limitations set for uh, sulfur oxides. And uh, we have been able to uh, conduct a very thorough study on alternative systems. We started researching the makerspace in 2016, reaching a decision of which way to go uh, in uh, mid of 2017. Uh, there are challenges involved as far as the operational capability of installing scrubbers. Uh, challenges that uh, have not been uh, addressed yet uh, properly in uh, the materials we're reading. Uh, implementing an installation from ordering to a shipyard is a lot more complicated uh, than it sounds. So we feel that despite uh, hearing numbers of about 3,000 scrubbers being ready by January 1st, 2020, and I'm referring to a study by Goldman Sachs, uh, as well as a study from uh, DNVGL that uh, there are approximately 1,600 scrubbers on order, at this time, increasing by about 100 last month with uh, the latest report on uh, Clarkson's. We feel that there's gonna be penetration difficulty being ready by January 1st. Whether that is uh, delays in engineering, procuring owner's materials which are sensitive, like uh, glass reinforced epoxy piping, and of course shipyard capacity, um, and the ability to service everything within time. These are gonna be major bottlenecks uh, going forward. Overall, we feel that having started from a very low banker cost environment of about uh, $30 in 2016, um, and the future market at the time being $200 uh, on the forward market post uh, January 2020, it was obvious that this would have an influence on optimum speed in the market. And uh, as we're approaching 2020, we believe the spread is going to increase. We're an increasing banker environment and that will affect the sustainability of, uh, of our company being able to comply uh, properly. Uh, it's, it's for us a defensive mechanism for, uh, for our organization. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, it's pretty much the same question to Dr. Barbaris. Uh, what were the key decision points for your uh, CAP 2020 compliance uh, strategy? I will tell you a few things about our uh, thought process. The CAP 2020 uh, regulation is a, actually, it will be implemented in 2020, but it's a very, it's quite old regulation, 2000, uh, as I more represented, Steve said, uh, from 1990s and 2000, etc. We had uh, various regulations, uh, and uh, since 2005, we, th we have this uh, mark that uh, uh, puts limits to uh, sulfur oxides that when they go to the atmosphere with the humidity we have uh, a sulfuric acid and uh, the acid rain. Um, 
right now a IMO through all these uh, regulations gradually is trying to align our shipping industry with that of the uh, of the other sectors of the economy and uh, we have seen uh, regulations uh, and, uh, and uh, the intent is to control all the hazardous, ha hazardous emissions like uh, NOx, SOx, etc. Uh, we at Safe Balkers uh, have been assessed uh, that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, trying to assess what uh, we should uh, be doing in relation to this equipment, we monitor that uh, right now it's a fact uh, that uh, in the, from the 1st of, uh, of uh, January 2020 this regulation will be implement, implemented and it's also a fact that uh, by 1st of uh, March 2020 uh, there is a ban of uh, non-compliant fuels in SIPs. So we did our homework and we, uh, our thought process is to install in half of our fleet basically the uh, more uh, heavy consuming vessels with scrubbers and use compliant fuels for all the rest of the fleet. So it's uh, our 50-50 decision. I think it's very fine uh, uh, what we are doing because uh, uh, the end result is that uh, a substantial improve on the SOX emissions which this regulation uh, tries to, to control. And uh, it's also in terms of, of, uh, of uh, implementation, uh, as uh, Mr. Lesko said just before, it's a quite laborious work that has to be done in, in detail, so to be able at certain point of time to deliver the right uh, system in your ship uh, and be able to operate it <coughs> and uh, comply with, the, with this regulation. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gorbulis, uh, exactly the same question. <coughs> yes, it's not an easy answer. And um, for our company, I would like to say that uh, uh, as Mr. Adamson said uh, at the beginning, when in 2008 the regulation was uh, for 2020 to have a global sulfur cap, somebody would think that is a very straightforward uh, compliance route by using uh, a fuel that is, uh, has, has a limit on the sulfur content. When in 2016 it was decided that the date uh, finally will be the 1st January 2020, uh, then a lot of controversy started on uh, whether the compliant fuel would be available by the time that the regulation comes into force. And this uh, has created, a, I would say, an unprecedented uh, debate on what is the compliant, uh, co compliant strategy. Uh, having the option to continue burning the high sulfur fuel oil by the installation of a scrubber uh, makes the decision a bit more uh, complicated. There is no doubt for every company, I believe and I heard from the two gentlemen before, that uh, using compliant fuel to either part of the fleet or possibly to the whole uh, fleet, it is a definite uh, option. So wh whether you are uh, going to install scrubbers or not in 2020, you must be prepared to, uh, to use the compliant fuel. Uh, for Euronav, this is the strategy at this point. We are focusing on the best preparation for using the compliant fuel and we have a lot of concerns for the scrubber installation for a number of reasons uh, spreading from the technical challenges that we heard uh, just before technical operation challenges when you install a scrubber but also we are not uh, certain that this upfront investment is going to pay back as has been advocated in this debate that I described before. So we believe that there is a lot of uh, speculation on what is going to happen 
and based on that, uh, the case of Scrabber has been promoted. Uh, on top of that, the majority of the installations is the uh, open loop uh, configuration where the scrubber water, the waste water, goes directly to the sea. So we believe that as this gradually, the use of scrubbers gradually increases, the environmental concerns of using a scrubber on, of open loop uh, scheme, uh, this will also increase. So there is also another concern, which is the environmental. Not only, I would say, on the pollution side to the, to the sea, but also installing a scrubber uh, demands more energy, so there is also an increase in the CO2 emissions. And, and the last, uh, at this point, I would like to, to mention about our uh, hesitation for the scrubbers, is the difficulty to actually control the compliance of a ship that is using a scrubber, especially in the open seas. So for the moment, our position is we put all our energy to prepare the fleet for the compliant fuel uh, use, and uh, we wait for a scrubber installation, maybe at a later stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Vastarujas, uh... We would like also your opinion, and especially um, due to your uh, current involvement in Scrabble projects, uh, a little bit more on the technical and practical sides when dealing with uh, such projects. Uh, I have had some in insight from a uh, tonnage provider point of view, which is a big difference uh, since in our industry the fuel cost is covered by our clients. Uh, I will summarize the strategy of the company in one phrase. Technical and operational flexibility. This is our target. This is the conclusion of a five-year study that was carried out by the now R&D department. We believe that the way to go is the compliant fuel. And the reason is that uh, at the moment, the most optimistic view says that uh, by 2020 we will have covered uh, maximum 5% of the total needs with scrubbers. So the simple question is what the industry will do, what the main ports that they have limited storage capacities or limited number of barges will do. And we believe that they will invest, of course, in the compliant fuels. And this is the way to go. This is what we have decided so far. However, don't forget that there are two speeds. There is a spot market and there is also a long time charter market, especially for the tonnage provider in the container ship in the, uh, industry. It is too different uh, to say that uh, we have ships in spot market than in long time charter market. And the reason is that uh, some clients require vessels to have scrubbers, to be equipped with scrubbers. And the reason is that there's still exist some specific routes where HFO would be available, so the liner companies need a number of ships so that they have to cover, to cover these lines. So they are coming to us and say, okay, we know that the compliant field is the way to go, we agree with you, but we need a number of ships to do the business. So, in our case, the strategy of the company changes a little bit and says that Yes, we have to be flexible and provided that we have a nice agreement, let's say three years charter, why not? Of course, as mentioned before, this is not an easy decision, uh, especially from a technical and operational point of view. There are certain limitations there, uncertainty and high risks. Uh, at the same time, there is a serious investment that in case that the investment will fail, then there will be serious commercial consequences. So, we believe that uh, it is very important each company to develop uh, their engineering staff since it is not so easy to, be, to rely on uh, third parties uh, for consultation and decision. 
there are, as I said before, many certain uh, technical issues, and uh, we know about the performance. We are not sure if the Scrabble will perform well all the time. We have heard many things about wear and tear due to the materials and the, uh, the acidic environment. These are known things that have been discussed a lot in the media. But I have to add something else. There is still uh, a fear, a risk, with the water flooding in engine room, which has not been stated uh, so much in uh, previous statements. I mean that consider that the majority of scrubbers, at least for our sizes that we are talking about 50 megawatts, which is still in for direct engines, we need three to 4,000 cubic meters per hour. If we consider a pipe with a diameter almost one meter to accommodate the drain needs of this system, we are talking about uh, if we have a height 60 meters, we are talking about more than 60 tons of water there. And the GRE pipes that have been advertised a lot, we know that they are quite good in the corrosive environment, but they have some limitations from the strength point of view. So what will happen if something will break there? We'll have a serious flooding in the engine room with potentially high risks. Taking all this into consideration, uh, I conclude to the same point that I mentioned at the beginning, that although there are risks, uh, we need to have uh, technical and operational flexibility on board to cover all needs that both spot market and long time charter market require. Thank you very much. Uh, now moving to a slightly different uh, uh, side uh, on this industry, uh, to the side of uh, charters and uh, I would be very much interested to learn more on uh, how charters uh, see the um, uh, CAP 2020 regulation and what are the position and the actions that are taken in order to uh, help and facilitate this uh, transition? Certainly. <coughs> so we like the phrase technical and operational flexibility. <coughs> I think that's something that's tremendously important to any charterer, um, but to deliver that will take planning that's happening now. Um, there's a lot of work to be done and um, across the, the team um, we're, we're working on multiple different aspects of 2020. So if I, I take you through it perhaps one by one. Um, we're, we're working very closely with the fuel suppliers. Uh, we've started testing uh, the, the new fuels already. Um, not many of them are, are available for testing right now. But as they become available, we test them both in the laboratory and also on, on the vessels. Um, we're looking for the usual things that uh, people have mentioned many times um, in this forum already. Um, and one of the things we'll be developing is a compatibility matrix uh, to help us understand how the different fuels work together. Um, but an important point on that subject is the, the prime method of handling compatibility issues between the fuels is to make sure that you don't blend them in the first place. Um, so we are planning on making sure that we can run the multiple different fuels across the globe and keep them separate all the way to the point that they're burnt in the engine. Um, other things that we're doing with the fuels is we're reworking our relationships with the fuel suppliers. So in getting close to them, we're trying to understand who are going to be the suppliers who were there to consistently deliver good for quality fuels in the locations that we need them. Um, so that's started now and it will be continuing all through 2019. I think elsewhere we're working closely with owners. Uh, we want to get the flexibility that was being described here. Um, and also it's about the readiness for the transition period. So we are working with owners to develop plans for preparing tanks for the new fuels as the transition happens. Um, we're working with them to ensure that we can burn the broadest range of fuels possible on the vessels and also trying to understand how we can, as a fallback, use MGO for long periods of time if that turns out to be necessary. <coughs> so fuel suppliers, owners, there's work happening already. Um, there's an impact on the charter parties as well. Uh, there 
I think we heard earlier in the forum that BIMCO is, is going to develop a, a new set of uh, charter party terms by November. Um, we're, we're, we're working closely with them on that and we're also working with our owners to, to make sure that those clauses are good both for the transition period but also for the operating period after. Um, another thing to bear in mind is the, the vessel selection. You know, we don't operate our own vessels. We, 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 we take vessels from the, the, the market. Um, sorry, I meant we don't own our own vessels, we charter them from the market. So fleet selection is very important to us. I think if we imagine a uh, new market scenario with a higher fuel price, it matters more how much the, the vessel consumes, uh, it matters how many bunker segregations there are on board the vessel and the flexibility that vessel has to burn the different types of fuel. So we're paying a great deal of attention to the, the, the fleet selection. So I think that's a, a flavour of the kinds of things that we're doing now uh, to get ready for the 1st of January. Thank you very much, Keith. And uh, now that eventually leads to questions uh, regarding uh, fuel. And, uh, uh, big concerns are uh, fuel availability, of course, uh, compatibility, and uh, all, all uh, related uh, aspects. So I would like to uh, have Michael's uh, opinion on that. Sure. Uh, so first of all, I think it's important to understand the, the fuel spectrum and the way bunker fuel is supplied now. And it may not be natural to a lot of people in the room that have kind of taken the supply chain for granted for a long time. But now that we're approaching a fairly big change, it's important to understand how bunker fuels are made and that uh, fuels now, especially uh, heavy fuel oil, is already blended. And compatibility from supplier to supplier is not guaranteed at the moment. So this uh, idea of fuels not being compatible, there's, that guarantee really doesn't exist now because a lot of vessels bunker from different region to different region. On top of it, a lot of fuel oil is produced in one region and then arbitraged to various regions for supply. Singapore is a very good example of that, being the, the world's largest supply port and uh, importing a very large amount of fuel oil. So when it comes to 2020 for high sulfur retention, that is gonna be driven obviously by the vessels that have scrubbers. So and uh, important in that matter to remember it's not the number of scrubbers, but rather the consumption of the vessels that is more important. Uh, as far as availability of fuels, uh, if you look at the analysis that's been done, not only before the IMO uh, did this initiative, uh, uh, but also other independent analysis, there seems to be a very general consensus that low sulfur availability is there. Uh, there's nothing to uh, say that these fuels are going to be bad. And in that sense, you can look at the point one fuels that are in the market now, and the reputation of those fuels have been fairly stable. But as other people have pointed out very importantly, uh, fuel management on board plays as key of a role as what type of supply that you buy. So it's very important to know that your crews are trained to do what they're going to do, as well as to understand uh, who you're buying bunkers from, who is buying your bunkers, how uh, your bunker group is reacting to their purchasing, and what relationships you have. And speaking on behalf of uh, ISO, a group that I'm um, part of, the working group for the marine fuels, uh, they've uh, been public in their stance within IMO and also in the news that the new fuels coming to the market would meet the ISO 8217 standard. Uh, there is a, uh, a considerations document called the PAS that is being developed by ISO, which should, will be available in 2019, that addresses some of the concerns with 25 fuels. There's also a joint industry paper being done by various participants uh, to, uh, to the IMO on the 0.5 fuels. So uh, thinking of all of this uh, in mind, I think it's very important to familiarize yourself with these subjects uh, and ask questions and prepare yourselves better for 2020 because the information is there for consumption. Buying the fuels now, a year before you're intending to actually buy them, <coughs> making those requests, th that does have difficulties. But the sooner that the demand comes to the market, it will be much easier for the supply to react. So I know there's a lot of calls for supply, but it's, it needs to work in tandem. Thank you very much. Uh, I see that uh, we have uh, 15 uh, minutes left. 
Uh, I would propose that I have a very quick question to uh, the to parts of the panel, at least, and then uh, proceed immediately and leave sufficient room for uh, questions from the audition. Uh, so, I would like to ask uh, mainly Mr. Reskos and uh, Mr. Barbaris, whether do they see uh, that uh, for vessels that have scrubbers, do, do they expect that a premium uh, will uh, appear in the charter rates? I think I should uh, respond. <coughs> uh, the premium is, uh, for a vessel that with a scrubber is related, is related to the cost of the fuel. The charter market is what it is, and the cost of fuel will be what it will be. So the premium will be related uh, to that. Uh, it's very comforting, and we all we all use uh, right now compliant fuels, and we will be using compliant fuels also in the future. This is very comforting, and I think that this is very important because we need to recognize one point here. It's different to say we emit uh, carbon dioxide, and it's different to to say that we emit sulfur. I mean, sulfur uh, oxides are uh, hazardous oxides. I mean, it's a co completely different uh, approach, and we should uh, always think and keep that in mind. I would like to uh, just spend one minute on some of the issues raised in the panel today. I think it's important for information purposes as well. I'll just uh, pick up on uh, the last point of Ms. Barbaris. Uh, we need more information and education in the industry on how scrubbers operate. Sulfur oxides are removed by the natural alkalinity of seawater, which turns them into sulfur and sulf sulfates. Sulfates is a, a primary constituent of seawater. If uh, there are actually studies that show that if you could collect all the existing sulfates in the seawater and compare it to the surface, that would be approximately 1.7 meters thick around the globe. Taking all the known oil and gas reserves and placing that sulfur into the oceans, that would be a one millimeter thick uh, uh, impact on uh, the existing sulfates uh, in seawater. Uh, we, we heard about um, uh, the issue of uh, reliability of systems. Scrubbers at sea have been operating for the last 10 years. There are at least 300 systems we know of that have been operating for 10 years. We've been operating our own uh, system since uh, early this year, non-stop, well in advance of the regulation, and that's something we suggest to anyone who is uh, going to go down that path. We've been monitoring everything. We've gone through a debate on engine flooding with two major makers from two different uh, approaches, one being in line, the other being U-type. And both parties engaged, and we all ended up saying that there is not a risk to engine flooding because of all that the parameters that have been taken into consideration for controlling uh, the flow of, uh, of exhaust gas. Um, as far as pricing is concerned, and where do we see the benefit? I think the major uh, uh, fault of the approach of dealing on uh, the IMO regulations through scrubbers was back in 2016. The numbers we all heard were in the region of five million dollars to install a scrubber. Once we started researching that, we realized that the cost for a first class manufacturer to, uh, to provide a scrubber, whether it's a new type or an inline system, was a fraction of that. That makes the business case uh, much more appealing, uh, whether it's a $200 uh, dollar differential uh, between MGO and heavy fuel and oil, or it's a $500 uh, dollar differential. As far as the scrubber story is concerned, we're a little bit indifferent to that. If it's larger, great, you will enjoy a better benefit. But the business case on the investment uh, is uh, much more straightforward than, than people uh, have expected. Now, as far as charter rate premiums are concerned, it's all about penetration. As I mentioned before, it will not be as fast as people are projecting. It reminds us of uh, the 2007 rush for new buildings, where there were delay in implementing scrubber installations. So we don't think it's going to be more than 3,000, best case, by January 2020. Uh, if that is feasible, that's going to consume 1 million, ton, uh, 1 million barrels per day of uh, heavy fuel oil, uh, when the entire industry consumes about 3.5 million to, uh, barrels per day. That's good enough to ease uh, the pressure of refining capacity and additional cracking. Um, and that is also a reasonable story whether you're going for low sulfur fuels or scrubbers. 
Uh, we believe penetration will continue on the smaller vessels, not phase one, but as optimum speeds uh, decrease and as vessels that are not economical become obsolete, people will start investing in scrubbers on uh, the smaller vessels, whether it's a Supramax or a Camso Max. Thank you very much. And the final question to Michael, and uh, trying also to link this with the subsequent panel on IMO greenhouse gases. Um, what, in your opinion, would take uh, for the industry to commit to new fuels uh, that are compliant, like LNG or LPG? Thinking ahead also to the uh, IMO greenhouse gas uh, targets. I think, frankly, that is probably a better question for the ship owners that are now having to invest uh, money up front in, uh, you know, in scrubbers. Is we, we do see ship owners even now looking at LNG, and clearly you've seen a trend in, uh, in power generation, uh, people moving away from uh, fuel and moving towards uh, gas. Uh, LNG clearly has a, has a case, uh, but as to what the uptake will be, it's really a question of how much money uh, people are willing to invest up front in, uh, in running an LNG. So it's maybe more of a question for the ship owners on the panel how, what they would look to do from a CapEx issue. Yeah. I don't know if any of the ship owners want to give a try on that. From our point of view, to invest to LNG <coughs> uh, is not a direct option now since uh, these are solutions mainly for new building projects. To retrofit the ship with LNG is something that requires a huge investment and very thorough feasibility studies have to be carried out first. In contrary, with the scrubbers, uh, the case is much more easier because uh, uh, don't forget that in the container ship business, as I said previously, the fuel is paid by the clients. So any deal is done together with the client and uh, the premiums are able to be amortized within a certain short period within the existing uh, charter rate. So actually uh, there is no uh, financial risk for us and at the same time, uh, I would come again to the flexible term, which is facilitates our clients also. So I think that if an investment has to be done, then the investment has to be with the scrubbers, uh, which is, let's say, a guaranteed investment for us. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to open the uh, <coughs> questions to the floor. Uh, please feel free to ask our panel members. Question is going to be Panos Zakariadis, Technical Director of Atlantic Balkarias, and uh, I'll be a member of the next panel on decarbonization. My question is at the IMO session that the decision was taken for application in 2020, ISO had made a worrisome submission which was uh, ignored. Uh, they, among other things in the submission, ISO was saying that according to the uh, IMO GSG G, uh, study, the availability will be there uh, if uh, there is uh, sufficient blending. Blending, in other words, uh, between distillates and heavy fuels to the point that the 0.5% sulfur is, is met. That means that the uh, resulting fuel will be in the region of 70% to 80% distillates and 30 to 20% heavy fuel. ISO was then saying that the flash point test that ISO has is not applicable to such kind of blends of high distillate percentage. And not only that, ISO said in that submission, if you apply the flash point test, you're gonna get a false positive. In other words, you are going to get a result that the uh, flash point is met, uh, the 60 degrees, whereas it's not going to be met and it's going to be much less. And perhaps this is a question for Mr. Shapiro, who said he is in the uh, ISO working group. Uh, 
what kind of flash point test are we going to have um, to check the flash point of the fuels of the fuel blends we're going to be getting in 2020 and afterwards? Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, I think it's very important to remember that ISO 8217 covers fuels from <coughs> gas oil all the way to heavy fuel oil. So it, it, has, it does account for different types of fuels and it has different me test methods. And as long as the fuel meets those test methods, there should not be an issue with these fuels. Uh, obviously, you do, with Flashpoint, you do have to meet the SOLUS requirement. And I believe IMO is actually now in discussions and looking at lower flashpoint requirements in the future. So as far as, as far as ISO stances, and we can look at specific fuel blends, but the percentages that you're mentioning, those are assumed uh, percentages. And there's going to be a variety of different fuels and blend stocks within the refinery that will, com uh, that will compose these blended fuels in a similar fashion that is being done now and you already have a fuel in the market, a 0.1 fuel oil, which is a blended fuel oil with a lower sulfur than what you're expecting in the future. So I think that, that should answer your question. And uh, if we, you have specific issues regarding test methods, we can look at them specifically, but there are different test methods for different fuels. And if somebody else has input on this, uh, feel free, but this is a fairly straightforward, I think. Mr. Uh, I will have a slightly contrary uh, opinion that I'd like to share with you. Don't forget that the existing fuels purchased by uh, the Houston area satisfied the existing ISO standards. However, we face such big difficulties. We have carried out some tests, uh, getting samples which are not the samples that we will have in future, the blended fuels, the 0.1, that the low sulfur fuels. And uh, we found out that the uh, standard test that we have today in the charter parties, we cannot have reliable results. So uh, our chemical engineers started to discussions with very many laboratories in an effort to identify which tests will be those ones that they will uh, finally uh, give us uh, accurate results. And still, we are in the middle of the way, and I think that there is a, a long way ahead of us. However, uh, from the other side, we believe that uh, the real need for testing will be the first period only, because sooner or later the market will be stabilized. At least this is what the history has taught us so many years. Uh, and our suggestion is that, yes, at the beginning, we need to try to find ways to test the fuels, uh, to work closely with various laboratories, but sooner or later, things will be stabilized. Uh, just to point, the Houston was not a flash issue. So that was, that was, not, that was not flash point. And there is work done, being done within the PAS to address the considerations that could materialize with the new fuels. So that PES will be available and should be uh, a document that will help with, uh, with 2020. So I, it's not all being left uh, in the wind. This is, this is being looked at. Mr. Rorbulis has something to add. Uh, yes, I would like to somehow agree that um, uh, the existing uh, already available for testing compliant fuels can prove that uh, these fuels will be suitable for use and uh, safe and uh, there are already in process a number of tests verifying that the, these fuels are uh, in conformance with the uh, standards and uh, safe for being used. Thank you. Uh, any other questions please? I think. Maybe I can ask one, maybe I can ask one question to Keith. I apologize, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. But a lot of discussion has been on whether the charters would actually pay or help pay for scrubber installations. Is that something that you as a charter you're interested in? So the majority of our fleet is going to be running on compliant fuel, but we will have scrubber fitted vessels in our fleet and we will be paying a premium to, to have them. There. <laughs> so yes, I think the intent is we should be able to pay a premium that will give owners a business case to fit scrubbers. Thank you. 
I think we'll have uh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Lamp. Yes, of course. Uh, actually, I have a question that I have. If an owner believes in the business case of a scrapper, why would they put the, the ship on time charter and not uh, gain the whole benefit of the scrapper <coughs> business case, keeping the ship in the spot? I, I think you, you put your ships on time, time charter because you're managing risk. So I imagine owners with um, vessels, with, with fleets, with many uh, scrubbers, will take a portfolio approach. Maybe they'll run some on the spot. Maybe they will time charter some out. Um, I think that's a natural thing to do if you, you're managing your risks. I just wanted to say that there's not so much certainty on the business case at the end. And, uh, uh, in a way, there are some doubts on what is going to happen. Oh, for, for sure. I mean, I, I think you, know, you can look at the current pricing, you can look at the forward curve and see a margin for your scrubber, but that depends on many things. It depends on how much fuel you're actually burning, how available that fuel is, are you in relevant ports where you can use that fuel. Um, it's also dependent on the evolution of the market and how quickly uh, the refining industry develops its own solutions to the, the, the challenge and, and takes some of that margin for itself. So at the moment it looks like there's a strong business case, but that's not without risk, which is why you know, taking a portfolio approach, chartering out, running on spot makes good sense. If I may say something here is that uh, the beauty of this uh, regulation, which the target is the, the, the right target, and the beauty is that uh, it gives you several tools. The one tool is to use compliant fuels, and now, nowadays we know that we can use compliant fuels. The other uh, thing that you can do is to invest in an exhaust gas cleaning device if you want, if you want to risk, and uh, expect that there will be a, 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 a payback period for this investment. So. This is the whole uh, issue. The important thing is the implementation, because uh, this implementation uh, sets uh, the level playing game for uh, this industry. And the level playing game is IMO 2020. This is what it is. And th this, all the regulations that we have, they, they set up limits for our uh, behavior and our compliance. The second point, just I want to mention, is that. Uh, because I've heard that uh, the, cri the criticism sometimes is uh, about the water you know, that you throw to the sea in the open loop scrubbers, and there might be changes. Uh, what do you think, wh where do you think this uh, sulfur oxides go today? They don't disappear in the sky. They fall into the sea or into the land. And the problem is not whether this uh, acid drain goes to the sea because sea has natural alkalinity. The problem is when the acid drain goes to the land. And that's why we have all the problems uh, that, that were mentioned and uh, all the killings. And that's why uh, IMO decided not to postpone the regulation for 2025. If I can just add uh, yes, and that uh, would probably be our last comment. Yes. Just on the, on the maybe business maybe case. To, you're, you're not to hear to only the scrapper lovers, maybe to hear the some other option. Yeah. I, I would just like to, uh, to add one last sentence on the business case. Uh, we believe that it's already documented. We've had uh, time charters taking vessels, investing together with the owner on the cost of the scrapper. That's one model in advance of the regulation. We have others that are willing to wait and write it out until the 11th hour in January and go full voyage. There is a combination if you have a big portfolio of staying between time charter where you share part of the, of the upside or the, whatever the arbitrage is with the charter for a long-term charter or, or just go a uh, spot. So the business case is there. We already see that it is done both on dry power and on the tanker industry. And the last one. Of course, this uh, discussion that can uh, go for long and we don't, I don't want to waste the time. Uh, the concerns about the environmental impact of the scrubbers is already being expressed in some studies, especially due to the fact that it is anticipated that the operation of the scrubbers will increase, so the impact will be accumulated, and this study of the accumulated impact of scrubbers has not been yet done. And the last thing I'd like to add is that it's not only sulfates that go into the sea with the wastewater of the scrubbers, but it's also hydrocarbons, heavy metals, and other stuff, which also is harmful. Yeah, I believe that uh, 
This uh, can take uh, for at least another one hour. Um, I think that uh, we as an industry need to address this question and open uh, issues. And uh, maybe all agree that uh, we can embark in an industry-wide study to see this. Um, I would like to sincerely thank all the panel members for the very lively discussion. And I hope that the audience was able to uh, draw from their experience and <coughs> some conclusions. Thank you very much.